Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Beyond the Gatekeepers. I am your host and moderator for this evening. I am Bishop Vanessa M. Brown, and I'm so happy to be here with you on tonight. I'd like to greet our Facebook Live audience, our YouTube audience. I want to greet uh, those who will watch us on Spotify on tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to greet those who are on Twitter, uh, those who will be listening to us on whatever social media platform that you will be listening to us on. I want to say hello and I want to say greetings and I want to thank you in advance for supporting Beyond the Gatekeepers. And so we've got a great evening in store for you. Before we get into it, we want you to tell us where you are watching this show from. So tell us your city and state. Shout it out so I can shout you out. I want all of us to start gathering and I need you all to do me a very big favor and make sure that you give us a big share. Make sure that you share it. This conversation is going to be powerful. So many things to talk about. And this young man is ready to talk about it with us. And so if you'll do me a favor and begin to share, let folks know where you're watching from uh, so that we can shout you out on every platform. I uh, want to thank Pastor Sue, who is helping us technically in the background and helping us to, to, to make sure that everything is right and running. We appreciate you so very much on tonight. I had, I had some technical difficulty, but Pastor Sue got us together. And so we are grateful. Uh, so who do I see? I see late Pastor Ronnie Jordan. Thank you for joining us. Rancho Cucamonga, California. Albert Reed, thank you for joining us. Uh, Luvinia Bean, thank you for joining us from Cape May. Sean Jenkins, thank you for being here. We appreciate you so much from Atlanta. Good evening, Renee Vickers. So glad that you're here. Far Rockaway is in the house. S. Lee Edwards is in the house. Thank you. Chicago was here. Darlene Franklin, thank you for being here. Uh, I believe Darlene is in Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. So glad to see you. Reverend Tanya Jackson, Newark, Delaware. Thank you for being here. Pastor Siegfried Benton, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Temple Hills, Maryland is here. Kendall Brown, thank you. Pastor Kendall Brown for being here tonight. Baltimore, Maryland. Valerie Davis is here from Atlanta. Dr. Tony McNeil from Atlanta. Robin Wiggins Ashford from Durham, North Carolina. Darlene Franklin is in Dallas, Texas. Thank you, Darlene. Colleen City, Colleen, Texas. Albert Reed, thank you. Jason Oliver Evans, thank you for joining us tonight. Charlottesville, Virginia is in the house. Joseph Reeves is watching us from YouTube and on um, from DC. Thank you, Joseph, for being on. Maya, thank you, Maya Vasquez. Harlem is representing. Mary Sexton, all um, from San Diego, also on YouTube. Maya is also on YouTube. Brian Dundee Holt, thank you from Harlem. So glad you're here. Herbert Jones, glad to see you. Boston, Massachusetts is here. Dave Tony from New York City is here. Reggie Robinson, Orange, New Jersey is here. T Mark, hi, T Mark. How are you? Durham, North Carolina is in the house. Crystal Peeler from Greensboro, North Carolina is on YouTube. Tyrone Sutton from Boston. Yeah, they're shouting you out, Pastor. They say they love you uh, and everything that you are doing from YouTube. Thank you so much. Darlene Pittman, thank you for being here from Queens, New York. Chuck Hunt, Monroe, Louisiana. Claudia Vieira Allen, Richmond, California. Garrett Ganusho. Thank you, Garrett, for being here. Louisiana, Faye Maestro Wilson, Atlanta. Oh, they are coming in. Gail Glover, Atlanta. Pepsi Brown and Maria Harris. Pepsi is uh, Las Vegas and Maria is Denver, Colorado. I love it. Gerard Hubbard. Thank you, Gerard, for being here tonight. God bless you, Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Pat Carson is with us tonight. Indianapolis as well. Samuel Ashley is with us. New Orleans. Elder Sharon Gill is with us. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Reverend Victoria is with us. Thank you, Pastor, for being here. Baltimore, Maryland, Rain, Charleston. Rain is here. I know Rain. Rain is on YouTube from Charleston. I love it. Thank you so much. I love it. The saints are in. They are gathered around. Make sure that you're sharing on every platform. You want to be a part of this conversation tonight. You do not want to, uh, you do not want to miss it. And so let me just start off with a few things. The first thing I want to say is that Bishop Flinder cannot be here with us tonight. Uh, there are a lot of things that are happening, and uh, she has to take care of some things on tonight. 
And so we want to extend our prayers to Bishop Flunder and to Mother Miller as well. Uh, the second announcement that I need to make, and I think that people are a little bit confused, um, Bishop Pearson is not deceased. And we see a lot of things going up that say rest in peace. And it's very disturbing to his family and to his friends. Uh, even Julian, uh, the son, said, you know, this is misinformation. He is not deceased. All that took place was that he had a video on yesterday to let everyone know that he is in hospice care and that he is transitioning, but he has not transitioned yet. He is still in the body. He can still talk. And, you know, he can, he, he can still talk, still crack jokes and all of those things. So we want the people to know that Bishop Pearson is still here. Now, we do expect that he will transition. We do not know when, but we do know that it is. And so we thought that it was uh, in, that it was incumbent upon us to make that statement on tonight because we see a lot of social media. And if you see someone that has actually put down rest in peace to Bishop Pearson. Um, you, you can just don't even, you know, I think it's important that we wait to hear from the family in any given situation, right? I think that we all know this right now, um, but it is uh, very triggering. Yes, Joseph, it is very triggering. And so we know that it's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So let's not, let's not jump the gun and let's be considerate of the family. Their children are on social media as well. His sisters are on social media as well. Bishop Pearson is still here with us until he is not, okay? And so I think that that's important. And if it's somebody, you know, you don't have to jump on their page and go off, just hit them up in their inbox and say, listen, you got a post up that says, rest in peace, please take it down, right? So we just want to um, establish order. Uh, we know that uh, Bishop Pearson is a man of order. And I know that he would want us to do that for him and for his family. And so we appreciate, we appreciate everyone. Uh, we want to make sure that we get right back to this. And so, yes, um, I've been given instruction that if, if there is a post up there that we ask that people, please delete that particular post that says rest in peace on your page. Okay. Um, we, what was happening. And I think the confusion was that he did a video just letting people know. And then people just started sharing and just saying how, you know, they respect him. They love him, all of these different things. And we appreciate that. Um, uh, but he is not gone yet. And so we just want to remind you to please just remember the family. Okay. But tonight we have a dangerous young man who is with us tonight a dangerous young man uh, who has preached for us, uh, 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 for, for the fellowship. Uh, and, and he has, he has, he has been with us. Um, when we had project access, that's what I want to say. He was, he was a teacher in project access and preacher. And it was several years ago, but at the end of the day, uh, he has done great things since then. He is the pastor of the senior pastor of the Myrtle Baptist Church in West Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, he is American minister and scholar in queer theory, religion, and theology. And he is none other than Reverend Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley. And before he comes, before he comes, I want to to read this. So I want to want us to leave his picture up because sometimes we get into conversations and we don't always have. Uh, all the information. And I want to, I don't want to treat everyone here as if we all know exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. So one of the things I know is that the world has been shaped through heteronormative lens, right? Gender binary, heteronormativity, narr narratives constantly seep into the collective consciousness of our society. And from a young age, we are told about the clothes we can wear, the toys we can play with, the colors we should like based on our sex assigned at birth. And so we see hatred directed at the queer community fueled by misinformation and cyclical toxic learned ideas and behaviors. And all of this and so much more oppresses 
queer identities and suppresses thoughts of being different, of residing outside of this heteronormative lens. And so furthermore, stepping out of the heteronormative lens often results in one's true identity never being seen, fully seen or recognized. And that is an exhausting weight for someone, for anyone to have to carry. And so this brother has made a decision. Tell your neighbor, he's made a decision. <laughs> and he has written an incredible book. And he has come to tell us about this book, Queering Black Churches, Dismantling Heteronormativity in African-American Congregations. It gives me no other pleasure and joy but to present this young man tonight to all of us at Beyond the Gatekeepers, Brandon Thomas Crawley. And I want to say before we get started, thank you for your courage, because this is a courageous and very bold move. Well, I want to say to you, Bishop, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share on this platform. I thank God for you, Bishop Brown. You know I have dropped in your inbox to tell you how much I love you and admire the amazing work that you are doing, not only in the New York area, but for the entire body of Christ and through the TFAM connection. Uh, and I also honor Bishop Flunder this evening and thank you so much for calling the name of Bishop Pearson. My heart has um, been turned towards him uh, for the last, honestly, couple of months, because those of us who are close, we know what's been going on. And so my prayers are with him. And I just want to say that before we go into this conversation, that I stand on the shoulders of people like Bishop Pearson. Um, a great deal of the work that I am doing and will continue to do will be in his name and in his legacy. And I also just want to share uh, a reminder of his amazing book, yes. The Gospel of Inclusion, yes, which sir. has um, planted seeds in the minds of so many of us young people who've been affected by him. So I call both he and Bishop Flunder's name as sacred sages. Uh, one that is um, present here with us and healthy Bishop Flunder and also Bishop Pearson, one who is still here with us. That's right. And who we celebrate yeah. the vessel that he is and the great energy that dwells within him that is so kinetic. Yes. Uh, his potential energy has spilled over into all of us. And so uh, if Bishop is listening, um, know that your legacy is safe because we love you mm. and we will continue to carry the torch in your name. Thank you so much for that, Reverend Brandon. I want to get down to this book. And so we'll tell people in advance that they can pre-order the book, right? They can pre-order the book. The book is not out yet, but I think in November. Well, it will be the end of December, actually. End of December, uh, okay. It will be out, and you can go on uh, Oxford Press's platform. You can go on Amazon. Like, we're really trying to give Jeff Bezos more money, but we'll just deal with that <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there are multiple ways for you to pre-order the book. And one of the things that I just want to share as a uh, tidbit before we get into the conversation, Bishop Brown, mm -hmm. is that uh, I am not making any money off of the sales of this book. I am donating every cent that is sent to me to an organization called the LGBT Asylum Task Force in Boston that finds queer people of color in Africa and in the Caribbean and I work with their executive director. He's a dear friend of mine. And this organization does the work of helping uh, queer people of color to seek asylum in America. We help them to get here and provide housing, pro bono legal services, uh, food, cards, um, access to child care, everything that an individual would need in order to survive in this environment, uh, it is provided through this organization. And it is my goal, I have launched a campaign to raise half a million dollars for this organization. 
uh, in the memory of my book. And um, th the reason it's half million dollars is because this organization has purchased two homes. Yes. To house uh, LGBTQIAP plus uh, Black and African and Caribbean um, asylum seekers, and they owe $250,000 per house. And That's so it me. is my desire and prayer to be able to raise that half million dollars so that all of the income that comes in can go directly towards this particular organization. So when you purchase the book, know that uh, the proceeds will be going towards this endeavor. And there's a huge campaign that's going to be launched in 2024 um, around my book that will be around raising money for this organization. Powerful, amazing. And you already have people in the chat saying, you got my money. So this right. is what I'm, this is, I love that. This is powerful. This is what needs to happen. And we're grateful. Let me start off with the first question to you, Pastor. And I just want to say, what provoked you? Because I believe it was a provocation to write this book. Thank you for this question. So um, I remember uh, I was in the second grade and I was washing my hands in my grandparents' bathroom at 231 Branham Avenue. And when I looked up into the mirror while washing the residue of the soap off of my fingers, I looked into the mirror and the spirit of God spoke to me. I'm one of those spooky type of people that Thank believes you. in spirits and ghosts and haints and all these sorts of things. I, mm -hmm. I really buy into our African ancestral yes. uh, mm -hmm. And so I heard the spirit speak to me. And there are people who may think I'm crazy, but I heard the Spirit speak to me. And the Spirit of God spoke very clearly and said that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and I affirm your attraction to men, and I am going to use you to sound forth a the music of liberation yes. to those who are oppressed who are like you. Now, I just want to just, just caveat and say that that same day, I was watching Family Matters and Steve Urkel <laughs> went into a little machine and he came out as Stefan. Yes. When he came out. I remember saying to myself, Ooh, that man is so fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my cousin, who was with me at the time, who I will not name, you know, said to me, You can't say that. You know, that's, mm. you can't say that. God doesn't like that. And mm. uh, so while washing my hands after that experience, God spoke to me in my grandparents' home. Uh, I didn't really know what God meant by that. I knew I had an attraction to men, but I didn't know what God meant about me sounding forth a sort of music of liberation. Yes. As time went on, um, I uh, went to graduate school in Boston and was called to pastor a church, the historic Myrtle Baptist Church of West Newton. Shout out to my Myrtle family, whom I love so dearly. And about seven years into my pastorate, I decided uh, I was sitting in the pulpit one Sunday morning and the spirit of God spoke to me and said, stand up and tell the people that you are a proud black gay man. And I said to the this is the same spirit that spoke to me in my grandma's bathroom. And I responded to the spirit and said, are you crazy? I just got a new apartment. <laughs> I just got a new car. How am I going to pay for all this? These people are going to put me out. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm sitting there, my assistant pastor who was up to preach that Sunday, she's preaching from the story of the daughters of Zahafala, mm -hmm. which were, should have received the inheritance of their father, but because yeah. of the law, they could not. So the Bible right. says they go to the tent and they speak to, to Moses and request that he petitions God. And my assistant pastor said that Moses just needed to come out the tent in order to commune with God, in order to have a hermeneutic of submission towards the law to give these women the rights that they deserved. Mm -hmm. And she then went into this litany, come out of the tent, Moses, come out of the tent. And I'm like, and I keep hearing, come out, come out, come out. And, I, and God is saying to me, Moses, come out of the tent. Mm. The law has said one thing and it does say it. Yes. Now, this goes against the tradition of a lot of my queer theologians who like to do all of these queer apologetics and say what the Bible doesn't say. I'm bold enough to say that the Bible does condemn same-sex interaction because it is rooted and written from a particular context. But there is a such thing called a hermeneutic of suspicion. The Bible says a lot of things 
Y'all and write so, that down. Herman Duda of suspicion, saints. We must be bold enough to transgress against the tradition of interpretation and even to transgress the text itself in order to be able to hear the voice of God. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting in this moment and I hear God saying this. And so I stand up and I say to my congregation, I am a proud black queer male. Mm -hmm. I, I say queer. I identify as queer. I know that's a term that is very laced with a lot of problems. We can talk later on about why I chose to use that particular word. I don't choose to use gay because I'm not happy all the damn time. And <laughs> queer for me is a sort of subversive presence. Yes. Uh, and um, um, although it was used as a derogatory term because we are a faith community of regentrification and Reclarification and reimagining. I've reimagined mm -hmm. that word as a term uh, of resistance. So yes. um, I, I stand up and I announce myself to the congregation as a proud Black queer male. Uh, and one of the things I write about in the preface of my book is that I was crying, and I often preach with my glasses like this. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, just a habit that I have. Um, and so all I could see is church lady hats. I, I, I pastor a, an older black church and I just saw church lady hats just surfing towards me. And the altar is bombarded. And one of the church uh, members, Sister Yvette Lane, she said to me, she said, Pastor, we already knew we was waiting on you. Yeah. So um, I make this statement. The church overwhelmingly affirms me. Amen. And then as a result of that, our church decides, OK, it's one thing to love our pastor, but it's another thing to prepare our congregation for the people who will inevitably come because of this announcement. That's so right. we launched a we, we established a, a task force or a core team to take the church through a process of becoming open and affirming, which takes two years. This is mm -hmm. after I come out because we wrestle with difficult conversations. One of the things that we discover is that there are no resources for black churches who are trying to do this work. All of the resources are from white denominations. The, the documents have pictures of white people in them. And there's already this assumption that LGBTQIAP plus presence is a sort of attack on the black family. It's a white disease. Yes. And the, the, the information did not carry with it the necessary nuances that are needed for having discussions around gender and sexuality for black congregations. So we initiated a, a self-initiated process. We mm -hmm. went through this process for two years. But after it was over, I went to my dissertation committee and said, wait a minute. I don't need to write a dissertation about affirming Black churches. That's what I originally wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I actually wrote two chapters for that. And that's going to be the second book, which I'm already halfway through, which is talking about a, trying to craft an understanding of black queer theologies coming out mm. of black affirming churches that have been started by queer people. Yes. But instead I said to my dissertation committee, I want to flip my project, which is somebody that anybody that's in a dissertation committee on a dissertation program knows that you never do. Mm -hmm. After I've gone through everything, I say, I want to flip my project to actually write about how black churches have queered their contexts that are historically black and historic institutions in black churches that were not started by queer folk, but were started by all black people. No doubt that many queer folk were a part of the beginning of many sure. of these churches as well, but you get what I'm trying to say. So mm -hmm. my committee said, um, Dr. Peter Paris, who's the father of black church ethics, he said, you know what? That's a great idea. That's what you ought to do. That will greatly affect the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So um, I studied a few churches in my dissertation. Then I... Um, then uh, got a grant from Calvin Worship Institute and also a grant from the Louisville Institute mm -hmm. in Louisville, Kentucky, to study every open and affirming Black church that's a historic Black church in the United States, and also to study all of the don't ask, don't tell churches that I could find. Mm -hmm. And after studying those, I created a methodology for any Black church to use 
that wishes to transition itself into being open and affirming. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this book really comes out of a lived experience. Yes. My black church wanted to do this work. We couldn't find any resources. Yes, Kelly Brown Douglas has written a book on sexuality in the black church. Yes, yes sure. Horace Griffin has written the book, their own. Shall we see them now? There mm -hmm. are many persons who have written about the problem, mm -hmm. but I felt called to create Amen. a solution. Hallelujah. A way forward for black churches. Now, I will, I will say that my church is not meant to persuade brainwashed, heteronormative, <laughs> conservative, homophobic and transphobic churches to be affirming. Mm -hmm. My church is instead written for churches who want to do this work, they just don't know how. For preachers who want to do this work, they just don't know how. And Bishop, I just have to tell you, there are so many pastors who hit me up um, like Nicodemus. Yeah, coming to you by night. <laughs> yes, saying, listen, I'm not queer, but I appreciate what you've done. I have free people in my church. How do I do this? Mm-hmm. And so this book is for those people. It's also for those folks who profess hypermasculinity yes. and toxic femininity. We don't talk about that as well. No, we um, don't. Those persons, it, my book is also for those persons who espouse that because they're in the closet and they're trying to cover up, but they really want to peek into what this affirmation thing is really about. My book is for y'all too, because it will help you to see that it is possible. I find that a lot of people don't want to go off into this work because they don't have any examples. And, and by examples, I am not besmirching the amazing work that persons like yourself and Bishop Flunder and Bishop Allen and so many others have yes. done uh, as queer people who are doing the work much like Horace Griffin talks about. There are a ton of black queer folk who are like, listen, I'm not about to sacrifice any blood, sweat, tears for my home church. I'm going to go and start my own space. I right. think that is a very prophetic work that is in line with the work of Richard Allen in the AME church. Mm -hmm. But there are also some people who have been called, like I feel I have, much like Jesus, to stay within the tradition that has mm -hmm. problems, mm -hmm. just like Jesus stayed within the tradition of his upbringing, the yes. Hebrew tradition. And the Jewish tradition, which is not to be mistaken with the state of Israel, that's another conversation, but let's just keep on going, mm -hmm. um, that, that Jesus comes and he stays within the tradition and he dies within the tradition. He's killed by the tradition. Yes. For the sake of trying to reform the tradition. And so, so I don't have any fear. You know, I don't have a martyr complex. But my husband will tell you, I don't have any fear. Like, like I'm a combination between you can crucify me and uh, I'm a mixture between Jesus and Nat Turner. You can yes. crucify me, but I might kill you before you finish killing me. Right. <laughs> uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in another state. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I am not to the extreme of pacifism like King that I am not willing to launch war like Nat Turner and... Um, and Malcolm X. And let me just say that you cannot judge me for this unless you have walked in my shoes as a queer person in America. That's because right. we can be killed at a, um, uh, at a gas station. But be it known to those who might try me, I am a gun-carrying, license-carrying believer. <laughs> and if you try me, honey, I'll come for you quicker than you can draw one out for me. All right. That's right. And you I better have to say that as a means of protecting my family. So don't judge me and don't come to me with that King stuff, because as right. a matter of fact, if King had lived a little bit longer and if we had really got to know King yes. in the era that was close to his death, we would actually see a different side. As a matter of fact, Bed Rustin talks about the fact in his notes that when he first went to King's house, that there were people carrying guns all over the porch. Um, right. So praise the Lord. You come try to pull a mother Emmanuel on Myrtle Baptist Church. We got something yeah. for you because we, we got care. some for you. Come on yes. now. <laughs> um, so, so this book was birthed out of a desire 
to yeah. provide black churches with a resource to respond to the issue of heteronormativity. Listen, you have said it all, black ecclesial query. This is what we're talking about here. For those of you that have just joined, you are on Beyond the Gatekeepers where we are talking about current events through a theological and justice reform lens. And we are here with Brandon Thomas Crawley, PhD, okay? And he has written a book and the book is called Queering Black Churches, Dismantling Heteronormativity in African-American Congregations. I just want to thank you for going out there and doing that work. Like really, like I heard what you said. There was a problem and everybody wrote about the problem, but you wrote about the solution. And so I am hoping that other black churches, right? Other black congregations in America will make a decision that this is something that we want to do and they have the resources through this book in other ways as well, but through this book that can help their congregation to become <clears throat> more affirming. And that seems like that is the gift that you are giving back to the black church. The gift they never um, even knew they wanted or needed. <laughs> yes. I, I, and I would also say I'm writing for the future. Um, yes. I am not interested in being popular or getting discovered or having fame in the present era. Mm -hmm. I am writing for the future of black churches. Um, and I'm very keen and aware that the work that I've constructed may not really take footing until I'm dead. Mm -hmm. um, and I expect to live a long life. I've, yes. I've, the, the Lord and I made an agreement that if I stepped out on faith and did this, that the Lord would grant me to be able to see a hundred. So yes. I plan on living a long life. I'm not expecting to die. Um, but um, yes, it is really written for the future because here's what I think. I believe that black churches are going to wake up in the next 50 years and they're going to realize that a lot of what we have been taught, our connection, our weddedness to biblical literalism mm -hmm. is indeed the very thing that will cause our demise. Yes. Um, and, 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 and I want to say that to a certain extent, when I say cause our demise, I want to say that a lot of black churches are already dead. This is yeah. why I love what Eddie Glaude said when he talked about the black church is dead. Everybody was up in arms. And I'm like, why are we, why are we going, why are we getting crazy over this? I mean, we are a faith tradition that believes that sometimes things need to be die and resurrected in order for the true power to be known. Absolutely. So I really believe that the black church is an incubator of truth, but that truth needs to be crushed to the ground in the form of a burial in order that we might be resurrected anew in a new body of Christ. Mm hmm. Uh, that is able to do more than just the physical one that we presently see. Um, and this work around queering black churches, I, I believe that one of the things I talk about in my book is that there are a, a number of ways to queer black churches. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would say is that the churches that are most ripe for queering are the churches that are don't ask, don't tell. Yes. We try to demonize don't ask, don't tell because of what it meant in the military and all of that. And I get the problems with it. But I need you to know that churches that are don't ask, don't tell are at least courageous enough to say, we don't know how to affirm queer people, but you're not going to mess with our queer people in this church. Absolutely. And so I want to celebrate. I know a lot of queer folk don't are not going to like this, but I want to celebrate the churches that are at least trying to do that beginning work. Yes. Because it's, th it's those type of churches where the type of conversation that we're having tonight and the type of conversation that I'm even going to be having tomorrow with a with a, a collegium of pastors around mm -hmm. this topic, they're interested in it because they're already don't ask, don't tell. All right. But it's a but it's a process, right? Like you yeah. can't just it's like baking a cake. Like you just you got to put all the ingredients in for the cake to go out come out right. So at the end of the day, these churches are 
they some of them don't even know that they're in process by the fact that they allow same gender loving people, queer people to come into their into their sanctuary and worship and be active and take on leadership roles and all of that, right? But yes. they are in process, right? Mm -hmm. And then so so let me let you finish with with the steps. No, you're right. They are in process. And, and yeah. I, I just want to pause and say that and something you just said that triggered that and I'll get back on topic. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like the word inclusion. Mm. And I am I, now this is different from what Bishop Pearson talks about. Okay. As far as the gospel of inclusion around us all being included in the body of Christ and there being no mm -hmm. hell and all of that. So mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. I am not right. at all besmirching the brilliant work of our sage. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about uh, is the idea that queer people need to be included in the black church. I got a problem with that because the truth is we're already here. Yes. Honey, we are the black church. We've been here, honey. <laughs> yes. There would be no black church without us. That's and, right. And the other problem I have with include so inclusion suggests that queer people have not already been a part and that queer people have not built the church. We right. built this thing. All right? right. The other thing that inclusion does is it centers heterosexuality mm -hmm. as the norm and says, okay, us straight people in the church are going to include y'all. We're going to let y'all come. We don't need permission. The church is already ours. What we need you to do is to affirm our presence. I see. And what we also need you to do is to do the hard work of realizing that the mindset of heteronormativity that has prevented you from affirming our presence is a mental illness that you need to deal with. Mm -hmm. It is a form of brainwashing. It is a problem. So it is not us that needs to be included. We're already here. Yes. You need to be purged. That's really what this is. It you is sound like you sound like a Pentecostal. <laughs> Listen, don't don't play with me because See? although I'm Baptist, I was baptized also in Jesus' name at the New and Living Way Bible Church yes. by Pastor Dennis. And I got yes, it the old yes, school yes. way. Yes, one way to God. Amen. I'm a tongue Hallelujah. talker. So um um so I, I, let me get back to the point of the multiple ways of queering black churches. Yes. The most prevalent way of queering black churches in America is a form called pastoral queering. Mm -hmm. Pastoral queering is when a particular pastor makes a conscious decision to say, I am going to marry queer folk. I am going to preach queer affirming messages. And I have enough cultural and social capital in my church that I dare somebody to tell me that I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Some examples of this would be persons like Delman Coates. Yes. Of the uh, Mount Enon Baptist Church, mm -hmm. who became extremely queer affirming when he ran as a lieutenant governor with a lesbian woman in Maryland. Yes. Another example of this is Jeremiah Wright. Absolutely. Who preaches the sermon earlier on called Good News for the Gays. He is our vanguard. Absolutely. Yes, he is. And he pastorally queers his church. There are other examples like Raphael Warnock. Absolutely. Who, when running for office, uh, makes public declarations about his support of the queer community and yes. even does so from his pulpit, making a connection between civil rights and LGBTQIP plus rights. Yes. These are just a few examples. Um, 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 Amos Brown yes. in, um, California. in California. Mm -hmm. uh, Cecil, um, is it Glide Memorial? I can't Glide think of Memorial. I can't think of his last name, but yes. Cecil Williams, Cecil Williams mm -hmm. is another yes. example of this. And I just want to say that I think it is a work of prophetic courageousness and the move of the spirit that causes these preachers to do this. Yes. And so I celebrate these persons who have done pastoral querying. And I will say that in my book, I am not a huge supporter of pastoral querying. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I'm not a supporter of pastoral querying is because pastoral querying doesn't last often beyond 
what my research has shown, it doesn't last beyond the tenure of the pastor. Oh, and it yes, becomes sorry. contingent upon the next pastor mm -hmm. to reinforce it. Yes. And oftentimes, search committees, especially of Baptist churches, who've had a previously existing affirming pastor, they don't make that a major point in mm -hmm. their search. Yep. And so it ends up being left up to the next pastor to either profess that or not. And mm -hmm. most pastors who go into churches that have previously been affirming that are heterosexual don't want to identify with that because they don't want to be labeled as queer. And they're like, OK, that's already been done, so I'm not going to do anything with it. And what it does is it puts queer people at risk. Mm -hmm. The other problem with pastoral queering is that it is often done via the bully pulpit. The call and response tradition of the black church, the response is only in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. I have yet to hear. And let me just say, I'm not saying that I want to hear it because you better not try it at Myrtle Baptist Church because I will <laughs> pick it down. I have yet to hear a person in a call and response experience in a black church say, oh, no, bro, I can't get down with that. Mm -hmm. It is always in the amen. Mm -hmm. So the pulpit becomes most pastoral queering takes place in the pulpit. And in the performing of ceremonies, not in Christian education. So are you trying to say that you feel like people are being forced in in a way? Yeah, I hear you. Yes. And because of the cultural capital of the church of the pastor, people don't want to. Well, you, you know how it is in a lot of black churches. Mm -hmm. After you've been there for a while, it's whatever the pastor say. Right. And so you don't want to go against that because you want to you don't want to be ousted. So mm -hmm. pastoral querying is prophetic and courageous. But it also comes with risk because yes. it can also leave queer people. The other thing that pastoral queering does is that the pastor is affirming, but the people haven't gone through a process. And, and the reason they haven't gone through a process is because nine times out of ten, the pastors don't want to lose people. Right. But Absolutely. I need you to know that in a queering process, losing people is not a bad thing. Because well, losing people or losing money. Losing people and losing money is not a bad thing. In my instance, losing people wasn't a bad thing because the people who were going to be terroristic against the queer people who would come are now gone. Mm -hmm. Losing money wasn't a bad thing because we act like queer folk ain't got money. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's true. And I just want to say that. Yes. <laughs> we got coin too. We got and coin too. Queer people that are waiting to invest their coins yeah. in that affirm them. That's right. I had people join my church from churches, from pastors who said besmirching things about me after I came out. Mm -hmm. And when those queer people came to my church, they had coin because yeah. they were tired of investing in a place that didn't affirm them. So yeah, it's not always a bad thing. And yes. we have to see that the other. The, the, so that's my thing about pastoral queer. Now, the other form of querying, which is imaginary which does not exist, is denominational mm -hmm. query. And yes. I talk about this from the perspective of the AME church. One of the things mm -hmm. I say is that I'll probably be dead when the Church of God in Christ and PAW uh, go through a process like this, but I believe it will happen. Mm -hmm. But the church that is presently, the denomination that is presently having this conversation is the AME church. Denominational yes. querying is when a hierarchical and an Episcopal structure makes a decision that has to trickle down to the lower rungs. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to say that I actually, I am of a believer. I teach this at Harvard Divinity School. I teach a class called Queering Congregations. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that that denominational querying is effective. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my students try to argue against me with this, especially the UMC and the UCC students. Mm -hmm. they, they just really want to argue with me about this. And I tell them each time, that my problem with denominational querying is that it is really a political method. Because in order to cause denominational querying to happen, it is really done through politics. But the problem is, is that that political decision never trickles down to the local level because querying is contextual. There is no one size fit all model for querying. 
You right. have to study the context in order to queer the context. But I think in the UCC, it's a little bit different in that the bottom line is that all churches are congregational, all associations are congregational. So no matter what the national church decides, no matter what the up top, the church, no church has to adopt it. So yes. My, the church, I could be, I'm UCC Rivers over here and we have adopted a, a, a open and affirming policy or we have adopted, you know, the fact that people can come and be affirming, but you can have a UC church over there and you can say, we're not doing that. And mm -hmm. you don't have to. And guess yes. what? There is nothing that anybody can do to you or your congregation to make you do that. Mm -hmm. Autonomy is mm -hmm. what all of these churches have. Yes. In and the so UCC. And you just proved why denominational queering doesn't work, even in the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. You, in order to implement that on the local level, it has to be an interest for the local church to actually be able to do that. So I've talked about what 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 is a courageous act which is pastoral querying. I've talked about what I believe doesn't work, which is denominational querying. So the question is, Brandon, what does work? Yes. Congregational querying. Mm -hmm. Congregational querying is when a congregation makes a conscious decision that they want to become open and affirming, and they go through a process of having intentional conversations mm -hmm. in order to queer its context. So uh, these conversations in a black context comes to talking about the history of heteronormativity. Where does heteronormativity come from? Right. And you'll have to buy the book in order to get the full scope. But in short, my argument mm -hmm. is that heteronormativity is a mode of survival that was morphed out of a period of our enslavement mm -hmm. in that our bodies were owned by white persons. And as a result of that, uh, anytime uh, 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 black males, enslaved males would seek freedom, there was this thing called buck breaking. Yes in which the members of the plantation community would be called into the center of the plantation and um, men were sodomized. Yes. And so what we see here is that the, form, that, that, that the first interaction that enslaved persons had with sort of... Um, practices around same-sex interaction was in the form of reprimand for freedom. And one of the reasons that we know, you know, there's this, there's this preconceived notion that uh, Africa, the entire continent of Africa is innately homophobic, but, yeah. but um, we know research has proven, you know, there's a book called um, 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 uh, Female Husbands uh, by Riley that talks about the fact that people that we now consider to be LGBTQIAP plus or mm -hmm. trans or intersex were actually sacred conduits to the spirit world in mm -hmm. many West Shamans. African, yes, yes. and Central yes. African uh, villages. Mm -hmm. and, and Africa, the continent of Africa does not become this bastion of heteronormativity and homophobia until after colonialism. That's right. And so when enslaved persons arrive in Americas, there is no preconceived notion around queerness as being derogatory right. as much as there are a lot of different opinions around it. Now, now that's sort of its connection with enslavement, and you can read the book about that. But the other piece is, the question is, well, when did that morph into a tradition in the Black church? My research proves that the first iteration of heteronormativity being preached from a black pulpit was in 1911 by Adam Clayton Powell from the pulpit of the Abyssinian Baptist Church. During the Great Migration, black people are moving to the north. 
There are no places for recreation. And so as a result of this, many queer folk in Harlem host what is called rent parties. They push yes. their furniture back in mm -hmm. order to have entertainment for the black middle class. Mm -hmm. White housewives who are watching this happen, they start writing op-eds saying, oh, these black people are coming up from the South, they're like beasts. These women are dressing like men. These uh, men are dressing like women. <laughs> There's all this variation in gender. So, so let me just let me just pause here and say I'm I'm from Harlem, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Born yes, and, and let me just say that this completely dismantles the argument of some of these people now that all this new stuff with these people wearing all of this gender stuff and all of this wearing stuff that doesn't go with their gender. Honey, this was going on in 1911. Yes. This was going on even prior to the Harlem Renaissance with yes. William Dorsey Swan. Like this, 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 this is this has always been going on. Okay, this There's is nothing, nothing new under the sun. There's nothing, nothing new, under, new the under the sun. And so they start writing all these op eds. And so Adam Clayton Powell Sr. Mm -hmm. in his desire to prove that black people are civil in the white gaze, he calls together the Urban League and all of these other major black organizations. And from the pulpit of Abyssinia, he launches the first ever campaign against homosexuals from a black pulpit. And yes. he does it using this phrase that predates James Dobson, a focus on the family. You all know yes. that terrorist. Yes. Um, he says that homosexuality is a threat to the black family. Mm -hmm. He does this. He launches an attack on his own. A black man. Yes. A black because preacher man. Because he wants to appear civil to white people. Heteronormativity in black churches is birthed out of black people trying to appear civil to white folk. Mm. Which is antithetical to what the black church is supposed to be. Right. And so my work, another thing that I will say is, is that the pre-reconstruction black church, I talk about this young boy named Luke, um, who is sodomized by his slave owner, mm -hmm. by his owner. I talk about other the fact that there are also uh, romance and queer folk within slave narratives that actually exist do, existed during that time. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that pre-reconstruction black churches are focused on black hope and black resilience outside of the white gaze because they're trying to congregate while the master's sleeping in Brush Harbor and Hush Harbors. And not once do we find in history where there was some usher at a Brush Harbor saying, have you slept with a man as a man? Right. Have you had oral sex with a woman since you're a woman? Mm -hmm. There are no questions about this. People like mm -hmm. Luke in the slave narrative that I investigate and interrogate from Frederick Douglass goes into these brush harbors and worships without any questions of what's happening with his genitalia, what he's doing with his body. Now, mm -hmm. part of that is because our bodies were not owned by ourselves. And so mm -hmm. a lot of it was also a product of rape and molestation. But the point that I'm making is that these questions did not happen when the black church was operating outside of the white gaze. But when mm -hmm. we get into the white gaze, black churches post reconstruction, black bodies are now free. And so they're being policed, policed by patty rollers and all of these. sort. this is why the KKK is launched because we're trying to police black bodies. Black right. bodies are then treated like they are a threat. <clears throat> and so you have people that are buying into the politics of respectability to prove to white people that we can out white them with civility. Right. And so when you take all of this into consideration, it helps us to understand that homophobia and transphobia yes. is a response to whiteness, mm -hmm. which is antithetical to blackness, which mm -hmm. means that you cannot be a black church and practice homophobia. You cannot be a black church and practice transphobia. You can be a church that is pastored by black people 
that is filled with black people. But when you preach homophobic and transphobic messages, you are preaching whiteness in a black context. And that is mm. antithetical to our ecclesial makeup. Let me tell you something, brother. They are not ready for you, but they better get ready. They better get ready. I wanted to just hone in on something that I read that's a part of the book, although I did not read the book because it's not ready yet, but I cannot wait. And you say, they say, maybe this is you. It is also a constructive theological tool that teaches black churches how to create non-separatist homosocial safe spaces where black eroticism and sexual expression are considered sinless behavior. Yes. I'm, go ahead. So let's jump off into that. Uh, one yeah. of the things that I try to do in my book is in the tradition of Audre Lorde. I get this from Audre Lorde, who writes about the power of the erotic. Mm -hmm. I challenge everybody to Google that on YouTube, listen to it tonight, read it. It's an amazing article. I try to reclaim eroticism in my book as a uh, as as sacred, as spiritual. Yes. Um. Um. Uh, I believe that we have been taught to do the unnatural, that we have been taught to deny our body's pleasure as a means of trying to control the flesh. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the flesh needs to be controlled as much as the, the mind needs to be taught how to, to give oneself pleasure in a way that doesn't put one's body in danger in the form mm. of STIs and HIV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to say in prefacing that as I'm going off into this Foucaulting uh, sex-free discussion, that I am not at all besmirching the history of HIV AIDS, which has come to pass because of us not uh, uh, leaning into the condom-friendly age of the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I want to say that while I am telling you go and have sex, while I'm getting ready to tell you to go and masturbate, to get to know your genitalia, while I'm going to tell you that I do not believe that fornication is sin and that expiration is a part of human evolution, I want you to do it with a condom. I want you to go and take prep. I want you to be aware of what a dental dam is. I want you to be aware of the procedures that you turn the light on when you're getting ready to put your mouth on that and you're getting ready to Come touch on it. Now. Look at it. Find out what things turn the light on, saints. Turn the light on. Listen, oh and when you turn the light on, it gets better because you can see everything. I wish I had yeah. a witness. Y'all did it in the dark or elementary. That's naive. Turn the light see. on. I want to see. Turn the light on. I want to see. Glory be to God. I want right. to see. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. But with this, I want to say that we have been taught that the way to be connected with God is to deny ourselves pleasure. Yes. And I want to suggest that the reason that HIV AIDS took over the way it did, the reason that chlamydia is on the rise and other STDs in Texas is because we are teaching abstinence, mm -hmm. which is something that should, we should never teach. Yes. We should teach our young people, as I teach mine at my church, that it is okay to explore sexually. Don't deny yourself masturbation. Masturbation right. for persons who identify as male is a mm -hmm. celebrating as a celebration of your own potency. For those who identify as female, masturbation is a uh, celebration of your ability to create and curate pleasure for yourself. For you yourself. cannot know how to be a good sexual partner to somebody else mm -hmm. until you know yourself. how to make love to yourself. Come on, saying So one of the things that I do in my book is that, is that I try to teach people how to see eroticism as life-giving. I try to teach them to see eroticism as even larger than sex. I try to even push them to see that eroticism in the words of Audre Lorde, is antithetical or, or is, in, is in direct opposition to the pornographic. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we think eroticism and we think pornographic. Pornography, when it is viewed in the confines of a healthy relationship or when it is viewed 
in one's own personal time in order to imagine. Imagination is very powerful. I think it's okay. But the performative nature of uh, pornography is problematic. It's yes. sexist. It also teaches us bad habits around sex. It doesn't teach us the importance of patience, especially around males who are having penetrative sex. Uh, it is very important to know that you cannot have anal sex the way that it is viewed on pornography. Right. Sphincter muscles need time to warm up. That's right. Uh, these sorts of things become very important. And so one of the things that I try to do is to talk about healthy sex practices and yes. us normalizing talking about sex, yes. talking about body parts. These yes. should not be off limits in the, in the church, especially right. not even the pulpit. We have to teach healthy sex practices because that is, is more beneficial in curtailing sexually transmitted illnesses than is abstinence. Abstinence is not normal. Abstinence is not of God. I'll stop there. So that they can Listen, they, they, <laughs> the saints going to have to go lay down after this. Okay. <laughs> so now here is, so there is something that Bishop Fundell has always talked about and I think that this goes along with uh, all of the things that you have said in terms of bringing, uh, in terms of coming to congregations and having these kinds of conversations, right? One of the things is that there should be theological literacy. One of the, the other thing is that there should be uh, sexual literacy. So that's something you just explained right there, right? If we, we can't have these conversations in church and that's the reason why certain things are going on and our children are out there and doing stuff behind their back because they can't have a decent conversation with their parents or with their pastor, right? And mm -hmm. then there needs to be justice literacy as well, right? So those are the three things that can also come alongside, you know, all of the conversation that you've just brought us on tonight. And yes, you know, to, that was one of the things that we used to, that people used to fight with me about early on when we first, the church would be 17 years old, but we mm. started giving out condoms because at the end of the day, what are we doing here? Why are we telling people? And, you know, i got people that's on the line so they know that that's from Rivers. We, in an in a offering basket, we had condoms and dental dams so that people could go home and, and on any given Sunday, and nobody had to know what you was doing if you felt like you didn't want people to know, and you put some condoms in your bag or you put some dental dams in your bag, and you're going on about your business, mm -hmm. right? And so these are the things that people didn't want us to do at the time because they said we were giving people a license to have sex. You don't got to give people no license to have sex. People doing having sex all the time with or without your permission. So mm -hmm. why not help people to be healthy? Right. And make healthy choices as it relates to them having whatever sexual encounters they're going to have. And, and, Bishop, let me, and Bishop, let me just say that when people tell me all the time, well, you're giving people a license to have sex. And I tell them mm -hmm. I would much rather them have sex with a license than without one, because <laughs> in order to drive in America, you need a license, which means you've gone through driver's training. You've been vetted to show that you can handle yes. this vehicle. Yes, and so, yes, yes. yes, I want to give people a license to have sex yeah, so yeah. that you can do it properly. There is a proper way of having sex. And by proper, yeah. I do not mean rigid and missionary. I right. am speaking about proper as in being able to take responsibility for your body mm -hmm. and also being able to care for the person whom you are sharing your body with. That's right. Or per se. Right. Yes. Yes. So, so Dr. Crowley, you have taken broad strokes and you have said a lot. I want to give uh, people an opportunity to ask you a question, if that's okay. It's already yeah. nine ten. We're winding down. But if you have a question for Dr. Crowley, I want you to put question and it needs to be a question related to what we've talked about. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, a question write the word question and then write your question now someone has asked the question already 
it's long, and I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's a statement, but so here it goes. Must we prepare to recognize the fact that the Bible is a powerful man constructed tool to indoctrinate people into sexism, racism, white supremacy, and every grade of homophobia? Yes, the Bible and its written scripture is responsible for millions of deaths globally. So yes, we have to question how do we religiously emancipate ourselves from many of the dangerous scriptures that has and is still killing people all over the world. So really it was a statement. Thank you for that. Can I, can, can I, can I just respond yeah. to that? Uh, I sure. appreciate, thank you so much for your statement. Um, I would want to nuance it just a bit. And, mm -hmm. and this is what I often tell my students. The Bible doesn't do anything. Yes. The Bible doesn't say anything because the Bible is not a person. The Bible is not an entity. The Bible is actually not one cohesive thing. The Bible is actually a, an encyclopedia of several books. I That's would right. say it is our interpretation. It is humanity's interpretations of scripture that has caused the terrorism that you stated. Because when we rightly divide the word of truth with the hermeneutic of suspicion, just as Jesus did, because please keep in mind that when Jesus is interpreting and giving explanations of these texts, he gives explanations that are completely different than the writers intended that wrote them. Absolutely. And he takes them out of their context. That's mm -hmm. for all of those who want to claim, you know, all, be wedded to that. No, I'm doing just like Jesus in that I'm reading this within its context and saying, OK, but this is what I say about this. And this is what the spirit of God is saying about this. So That's right. I, I want us to be very careful to not further enable the body to the Bible to do more harm by treating it like it's a person. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to see that it's methods of interpretation that have not included hermeneutics of suspicion that have mm -hmm. actually created this terrorism. I thank you for that. There are several questions that are coming up. I want to get to them. And really quickly, I just want to say that it's important um, throughout this whole conversation um, you know, when people want to refer to the Bible, it's OK for us to interrogate the text. Mm -hmm. I think that people we kind of grew up with this notion that we cannot ask questions. We cannot mm -hmm. ask God questions and we cannot ask questions of the text. Please mm -hmm. ask all the questions that you need of the text so that you can try to understand what is being said to you. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I said that. Mm -hmm. uh, um Here's a question. What is your advice to young preachers who are becoming open and affirming? Huh. Who are becoming open and affirming. What would be my advice? Um, my advice would be don't make the mistake of trying to preach people into being open and affirming. Begin with the Bible studies. Because um, pulpits uh, are not the best places to facilitate conversations like this. That's it right. really is in Christian education because you give people an opportunity to ask questions. Yes. Uh, we preach sermons and then afterwards, you know, people come up and shake our hands and we're trying to move and people can't really remember what is said. Christian education is a great way to do the work around affirmation. The other thing that I would recommend is that you follow the following pattern. Don't begin by talking around about hetero, uh, um, heteronormativity or, to use the other word, homophobia. Mm -hmm. Instead, begin the conversation talking about racism. The Bible was used to support our enslavement. The Bible is also used to undergird American racism. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors had a hermeneutic of suspicion around that to the point that um, Howard Thurman's grandmother said, tear out the parts of the Bible that come from Paul because I ain't reading That's him because he's still I'm slave not... to the masters and I ain't right. obeying the damn master. All right? Right. So start talking about racism. Then move to sexism. Why do you want to start with racism in black churches? Because everybody in there black. That's Why right. do you want to move next to sexism? <laughs> because everybody, the majority of the people in the black church are women. That's right. We talk about how the Bible has been used to support sexism. Mm-hmm. Wives, submit to your husband. Listen, I tell, I told my members from the pulpit. Now, let me say stuff I say from the pulpit. You can't say I've been pastor my church for 15 years. I've earned the right to do it. I ain't got to worry about them kicking me out over stuff like this because they trust me and they know me and I've taught them. Mm -hmm. But I tell my people all the time, uh, don't you submit to no damn man. Mm -hmm. Submit to your, what do you do? 
No, 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 no. This is not a one sided thing. We are submitting to God. And through that, we are submitting to each other. But That's you are right. not going to be. No, there is no such thing as the man is the head of the household. Uh, I'm not about to. Don't you as a woman wait till you get home to ask your husband what was said of the gospel? Because women are supposed to get silent in church. Mm -hmm. There are Biblical scriptures that support. Rape. David was wrong. He swept his own daughter's molestation up under the rug. Like sexism is supported by the Bible. It Let's is. stop this stuff. All right. But there ain't a there. Well, there are some. Let me not say there aren't any. But let me say that that there's a large number of black women in black churches that are tired of this BS. Mm -hmm. They are tired of these small-minded men trying to garner a corner of control because they don't want to be seen as less than masculine. And right. so they want to trample on black women as a way of pompously parading their masculinity. All right. Yes. So dealing with dismantling sexism becomes a next great thing. And then when you make that turn to homophobia, if they've had a hermeneutic of suspicion around race, if they, because if they've had a hermeneutic of uh, a suspicion around uh, gender as far as sexism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then it becomes easier to start that conversation around affirmation. Uh, that the other wonderful. thing that I would say is don't be afraid of scripture. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of scripture. One of the worst things that you can do is just say, well, we just ought to love everybody. That don't make no sense. That don't help me to deal with the clobber text. That don't help me to deal with Leviticus. That don't help me to deal with Romans chapter one. Man shall not receive in himself that meat which is recompense. Deal with scripture and yeah. utilize resources outside of your own preaching brain. Right. Go and deal with people like Horace Griffin. Deal with people like um, Will Gaffney. Deal with mm -hmm. people like uh, Patrick Chang. These are the sort of mm -hmm. resources that I would encourage you to do. Good, good, good. Um, here's another question. How do we build a network of clergy and believers to support those congregations ready to be queered? Mm. Huh. Well, I, I think one thing, uh, one in, in the American Baptist churches, which, which my church is American Baptist, we have actually teamed together as affirming churches, the affirming churches of the American, the affirming American Baptist Church. It's something like that. I can't remember the acronym. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually exists in some denominations where persons who are affirming are already linking together to do this work. <clears throat> there is no network presently for black churches that have not been started by queer folk. And uh, I'm interested in starting that. Uh, I, I, I am not interested in starting a denomination. I'm not interested in starting a fellowship. Um, the Bible says one who desires the office of a bishop. I don't desire that. I don't desire to pastor pastors because pastors are a lot of work. I'll just stick with people. Ah! <laughs> uh, pastors are like uh, manure. If you spread us out, we do good fertilizer. But if you lump us together, we smell like... I'm my, not gonna say my, my, my. Um, so I don't have a desire for that. But I am interested in possibly a network like that getting started. I think I think one of the things that will have to happen is for there to be a sort of wave of a number of churches to want to do this work and for conversations to be started. Um, if you are presently, the person who asked the question, if you are presently within an existing denomination, it might be good to seek out persons within that denominational tradition who are doing this work and to begin mm -hmm. with small networks of support exactly. in hopes that it might evolve into something larger. Thank you. Do you encourage therapy around sex and mental illness? Yes, I do. When black folks move into white neighborhoods, it creates white flight. How does queering congregations not create self-right flight? Churches mm -hmm. need people with resources to survive. Hmm. I am not so sure of what it sounds like the person is saying when black people move into a neighborhood that white people uh, move out of that neighborhood. And I would say that in that instance, there's no way to prevent that. 
except for except for to purge those white people of their ignorance. But as long as they are dwelling in that ignorance, they are going to move out of that vicinity. In the same light, um, when heteronormative people who are pre-programmed uh, with a theological mindset of, of uh, homophobia and transphobia, when they take flight out of churches, I think they are also dealing with a psychosis. And, and, and I don't know, you know, I think we've got to we, we've got to let go of trying to keep everybody. We have a problem with losing people. You don't have to keep everybody. Yes. And let me just say that that one of the things I told my church, I was worried. I was like, if the budget goes down, I ain't going nowhere. You can just take it out of my salary and figure out how we're going to reallocate it because I believe in this. I, I think, you know. We all love Jesus and we all wear crosses, but don't none of us want to get up on one. Mm -hmm. And and getting up on a cross means um, I, I think about the song we used to sing, though no one joins me, still I will follow mm -hmm. uh, the cross before me, uh, the world mm -hmm. behind me. I, mm -hmm. I, I think many of us have gotten comfortable in our many empires. And to do this work, there, there is no way to do this work in which you are able to avoid risk and loss. That's it. I think that people harp on the fact, well, what about the one? Jesus left the 99 and went and got the one. And I get that. But there is absolutely no way that you can do this work and not lose people. You're well, going just, to lose people. Well, let me just say that when I've had, I had someone actually in our discussions to bring up that text that you did. And what I, you know, I warned my members, be very careful when you want to try Bible wars with me because <laughs> I know exactly. my word and I've studied this stuff for a very long time. Um, when Jesus is talking about leaving the 99 for the one, he's not talking about running after white folks or running after straight people. He's actually talking about leaving the straights in order to run after the queer. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> because the aggregation, those are, those are the ones who have been following the way that has been prescribed to them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, you, you know, I, I want to see the work of queering the church as the going after the one. Because everything has been focused on heterosexuals, marriage mm -hmm. ministries, just everything. Everything's been focused on them. And no one has come to see about us. Mm -hmm. So the work of queering black churches is actually the work of going out and getting the one. I love that. Last question. How can Pentecostal denominations, local congregations reconcile their historical performance and pursuit of piety? with the need for sexual education? So, um, post, Azusa, Pentecostalism is gonna be hard to queer outside of establishing one's own church in the Pentecostal tradition. Um, but the establishing of churches, the apostolic tradition of establishing churches is a major part of Pentecostal ecclesial history. Mm -hmm. This is a major part of who we are as Pentecostals. I identify also as a Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Um, an apostolic one at that, you know, yes. we, we are Pentecostalism on steroids, the apostolics. <laughs> um, That's true. um, and so, you know, one of the things I, I, I want to say is that I think it is very powerful for people who want to remain and fight, but that needs to be your cause and that needs to be your call. And you need to know that God called you to do that. God did not call James Tenney to do that in the 1970s and 1980s. He didn't. 
Um, mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he was put out of the Kojic Church there in D.C. and started a revival for LGBTQIA plus folk and started a church. And at the same time that this was going on on the East Coast, it was also going on on the West Coast with Bishop Carl Bean. This is what mm -hmm. my second book is all about, writing out the history of, um, of these affirming church movements. But, um, and I, I would also say just an extension of also Bishop Dunadrick McClooney's work, who did amazing work in his Pentecostal primer, uh, progressive Pentecostal primer, I think it is that he wrote. Um, and, but, but, but I want to encourage the person who posed that question to think very deeply around if God is calling them to do this. Mm -hmm. Because I need you to hear this piece. And this is one of the things that I'm investigating in my second book. Out of the churches that have been started by black queer folk, all of them have been Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Not one has been a black queer AME church started by black queer folk. And not one has been a black Baptist church. Mm -hmm. They've all been Pentecostal. And I want to suggest that Pentecostalism becomes a bit different in this light, that maybe you need to go and find an affirming Pentecostal church that has been started by queer folk because their starting of that church follows in the Pentecostal tradition of um, the apostolic move of establishing <laughs> congregations. Yeah. That's the way I would sort of uh, think around that. Uh, but. If you feel that it is that this is the Galgotha that you are to be crucified on, that's <laughs> surely. But no, you're going to be crucified. Mm -hmm. You are going to be crucified. Uh, but if that is the suffering that you so choose, know that we are here to support you and that eventually you will reign with him if you suffer with him. Amen. Thank you so much. Dr. Brandon, you have been uh, life-changing to many. I am so excited about what I feel God is about to do for you, um, even as it relates to this particular book. And I am looking forward to see the amazing things, the amazing things, the amazing things that that God has in store for you. Um, I want to encourage everyone to pre-order the book, Queering Black Churches. Visit Amazon. It is down in the chat and in the comment section. I want to, uh, somebody said, Lord, bring Dr. Crawley to TFAM for a life class. Absolutely. We can, we can arrange that. Amen. Um, I just want to encourage you all to get the book, get the book for your congregation, get the book for your pastor, get the book for anybody that you believe uh, should be reading this book at this time. I want to thank you for your time. I know you have a very early morning. Um, before you leave, please give me a final word that you would like for the people of God to hear tonight. I want to speak in this moment for those of us who are in the affirming movement and we've gone through these phases of accepting ourselves uh, many, many years ago. Sometimes we can get so deep in our affirming movements that we forget the beginning. And so I want to speak to some person who comes across this stream, who is just beginning the process of getting to know and getting to accept yourself. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that you are fearfully wonder and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God. That God is too vast to just be heterosexual. That God encompasses a mirror image of every creation that God has ever fashioned. Which means that you can even find your queerness in God. Yes. God made you on purpose. Your queerness was not a mistake. God loves you. And not only does it get better, but I want you to know that it's getting better. Yes, it is. God is doing something in the world. Mm -hmm. The presence of a bishop, Vanessa M. Brown, is proof that there is a vibration happening in the earth. And if you would just hold on and wait, 
I know it seems hard, hard. And I know sometimes that self-termination seems like the only answer to just not live anymore. Keep living. Keep pushing. Keep believing. I am living proof. Let me be an example to you that it is possible to love yourself. It is possible to receive the love that God has for you, even though the church doesn't tell you. And that it is also possible to find someone who will love you for the true person that you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I love you. God loves you. Bishop Brown loves you. T-Fam loves you. Yes, Myrtle loves you. Yes. And the world needs you to live. Yes. To live on purpose in Jesus. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Brandon. Thank you so, so, so much. Powerful. We're going to go to two commercials. <laughs> From the blues to hip hop, African Americans have driven sonic innovation for more than a century. While styles have changed, there's one sound that's remained constant, a source of strength and courage, comfort and wisdom. Gospel. That's a little bit of gospel. Gospel music is soul. Gospel music is R&B. Gospel music is funk. It's hip hop. Gospel music is the full spectrum in terms of its sound of black music and beyond. Mahalia Jackson, mm -hmm. what was special about her voice? She believed every word she was singing, mm -hmm. and she wanted you to believe it. Preachers have style, right. gospel singers have style. Right. Ain't nobody to me like Jesus. Black Ain't style in music and preaching Ain't is similar because it allows black people to believe that they can survive a bit longer. My mother had gone to New Bethel Baptist Church. Is God still standing there? C.O. Franklin would preach and then Aretha would sing. Oh my God, if you ain't got the spirit then, you dead. The sermon becomes the song. The song becomes the sermon. God, we ask that you would reinvigorate somebody. It's almost as if there's a soundtrack in a church setting. Amen, brother. That was beautiful. For generations, gospel music and preaching have formed the bedrock of the black religious experience. The sound still connects people. The sound still gathers people. These astonishing art forms, caring and enduring tradition, continue to evolve. Do you think there will always be gospel music 100 years from now? I don't see how we can thrive without gospel music. That's right. I say it's going to always be there forever. Listen, as we tell the story of how a people learn to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. This is the powerful story of gospel. And we want to just make sure that you support our broadcast, please, by sending a donation to us via Cash App at Dollar Sign TFAM Annual or to our PayPal at www.paypal.me forward slash TFAM Justice. We appreciate your support on the Beyond the Gatekeepers. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We say thank you, Dr. Brandon. We appreciate you and your good work. We want to encourage everybody once again to pre order the book. At the end of December, it'll be ready for you. 
Make sure that you get it. He told you where the proceeds were going. That's all the more reason to purchase this book. It's a perfect time to give a Christmas gift to somebody. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and God bless you. Thank you.